Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. If you've been with us recently, you know that uh, we are looking in the book of Revelation. So take your Bible, turn to the book of Revelation, chapter tw uh, 12. And let's go to the 12th verse, and we'll start there. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens. That's not where we are, is it? No. And ye that dwell in them, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth a man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time, and time, and half a time, and from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus. Not so good down here. No. But good up there. Yes. Wonder why. I wonder why. <laughs> well, we're studying the section of uh, Revelation, which is the apogee. No, not apogee. It's the, the bottom of the chiasm. It's the, the focal point of the book of Revelation. And we're going to come in a few moments to the text, which is the very center of the book of Revelation. And this is the part that the whole book is focusing on. It's the part, the last verse of chapter 11 through chapter 14, that is core to our understanding of all of Scripture. So I hope you are alive and awake and got your hearing is turned up if necessary. Uh, we're going to try to pay very careful attention as we work through this part because this is the core teaching of the book of Revelation. We start out in chapter eleven nineteen with God's temple in heaven was opened. I'm reading from my Good News translation. God's temple in heaven was opened and the covenant box was seen there. Then there were flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder, an earthquake and heavy hail. So now he is looking into what place? The most holy place. The most holy place in the sanctuary in heaven. Have we had any experience of looking into the sanctuary prior to this in the book of Revelation? Every new group of sevens opens with another look into the sanctuary in heaven. What do you suppose that implies? It's important. It's important. <laughs> Who might be there in the sanctuary in heaven? Jesus. God. God suggesting that what happens in each of these things has something to do with God's plan for this earth at least, for the universe perhaps. Well, in this section, located in the very heart of the book of Revelation, we read about the earliest event in the known history of the universe, apart from God's existence, we know God exists forever, and the existence of the angels, apparently they were before this section in Revelation 12, and then there was war in heaven. The only information that we know about what preceded this war in heaven was one, the existence of God. We know about John 1, 1 to 3 and other places like that. And by implication, the creation of our universe, in other words, 
God inhabits something, there must have been something out, out there, may not be exactly like what we have now, but at least there was something out there. I have a question. Yeah. Were they shooting and having cannons and bombs in heaven? Of course not. What, what kind of war? But I want you to hold that question because oh, we're going okay. to focus on it in a moment. Because that's okay. unusual, war in heaven. Yes. And then three, the angels were there, apparently, because there was war and the angels were involved. And four, beings in other parts of the universe apparently were there. And because Job 38, 7, if we can look at that for a second, in the dawn of that day, and it's talking about creation here, in the dawn of that day, the beginning of that day, the stars sang together. Now, is this talking about uh, astronomical bodies singing? I don't think so, because it's, and the heavenly beings shouted for joy. Now, if you know about Hebrew parallelism, the dawn of the, the stars matches the heavenly beings, and sang together matches shouted for joy. So the heavenly beings are the stars, and who are those? Angels. Well, they could be angels, but it's talking about angels separately. These apparently were other beings other in other creators. parts of the universe. So those were, they, they were there. And if you are interested in knowing more about what went on there back in the very beginning, do we have a handout that we don't have time to talk about right now entitled The Great Controversy in Scripture? And you can find that on our website at www.theox.org, theox, t h e o x, dot o r g, and look under other resources. This section of the Book of Revelation can be divided now into four parts. There's an introductory sanctuary scene that's one verse. The most holy compar compartment of the heavenly sanctuary is open, and we see the ark, the covenant box representing God's throne revealed. And there it is. We just read about it. This is followed by six scenes of what we might call, or what we might call video clips, or snapshots of the great controversy. And those take us from Revelation 12, 1 to 13, 18. And then three, as we've seen through, with other groups of sevens in the book of Revelation, there's a pause between number six and number seven. And during this pause, some other things happen. There's an assurance to God's holy people, that is, the 144,000 will stand on the sea of glass. This is an assurance that the great controversy will end with God and his victorious children surrounding his throne in heaven. But there's still work to do, and always these assurances are associated with what? Work to do, task to do, assignments. The three angels' messages must be proclaimed here on this earth as the final fulfillment of God's plan here on earth. And then there's a fulfillment Drawing the whole thing to conclusion, the final scene from Revelation 14, verses 13 to 20, the seventh scene representing God's judgment is discussed in the form of two harvests. So in this, these basically three chapters in one verse, what do we have? How, much, how, how long is the span we're talking about here? From eternity back to eternity forward. Eternity back to, at least as far as this earth is concerned, it doesn't talk about what God was doing before he decided to create our earth, but back at the very beginning of anything to do with sin, for sure, to the end, in time when sin is destroyed. That whole span is covered in these two chapters and one verse. So in this section of Revelation, we notice that John saw events scattered from the very beginning of history of sin all the way down to just before Jesus returns. And of course, later in Revelation, we're going to talk about what happens after he returns. Also in this section of Revelation, we're going to see some very clear parallels to scenes from the book of Daniel. What do you suppose that implies? Maybe there's a single author, a heavenly mm -hmm. author that was involved with writing both of these books. A Daniel... Um gives brief snapshots and Revelation expands on it. Is that what it is? Revelation in covers some cases. more in depth? At the end of Daniel, we're told to seal the book, shut it up, seal it. In Revelation, we're told the book is open. So the two fit together. 
So, as we've noticed, in Revelation there are seven churches, Revelation 2 and 3. There are seven seals, Revelation 6 and 7. Seven thunders, Revelation 10, 3 and 4, that we are not told about. Seven trumpets, Revelation 10 and 11. Seven plagues, we're going to get to in the future, Revelation 15 and 16. And finally, seven songs in Revelation 18 and up to Revelation 19, 10. So, the book of Revelation is full of sevens. Those songs at the end are sung about the fall of the faithful, I'm sorry, the fall of the false mother. We're going to talk about a true woman. We're going to talk about a false woman. But we also discover there are seven scenes here describing the true church pictured as a true mother and her relationship to the great war and the devil. So, what are those seven scenes? Let's look at them. Revelation 12 uh, one, two, three is the first scene. Let's look at that. Then a great and mysterious sight appeared in the sky. There was a woman whose dress was the sun and who had the moon under her feet. Norm, would you like to draw that for me? How would that look? <laughs> <laughs> Artists have had a real problem of figuring out how, how do you uh, dress a woman in the sun and put the moon under her feet. You could, we can figure out how to sort of portray that. But, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was soon to give birth, and the pains and suffering of childbirth made her cry out. Another mysterious sight appeared in the sky. There was a huge red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and a crown on each of his heads. So we are being introduced to whom? The woman and a huge red dragon. Okay. And a child. And a child. And a child. They're fighting over, basically. Mm -hmm. Okay, so these are the main players in this first part of this sequence of seven. The second scene, Revelation 12, 4 to 12. With his tail he dragged, this is still talking about the dragon. With his tail he dragged a third of the stars out of the sky and threw them down to the earth. He stood in front of the woman in order to eat her child as soon it was, as it was born. Now, how do we understand those verses? Or actually with that verse? Those were the, the third of the uh, angels who followed the devil. Okay, this is the only place in Scripture where we have any numbers connected with that. The idea that a third of the angels fell with the devil, this is the verse. It's the only verse in Scripture that specifically talks about any kind of proportions or numbers or anything. So of the angels, all the angels in heaven, a third of them turned against God and that's, followed the dragon? That's the way we understand this verse. Yeah. We've, when we've had some other thirds, it's kind of meant a significant portion, but not 33 and a third percent. Yeah, we're not, yeah, we're not talking about exactly 33 and a third percent. We're talking about a, a significant portion. Yeah. Um, then she gave, and I'm reading on verse 5, then she gave birth to a son, this would be the, the pure woman, gave birth to a son who will rule over all nations with an iron rod. Now, notice something interesting. She gave birth to a son, and when in history would we place that? Would that be Christ's birth? We, we uh, virtually everyone who reads this and, and believes that Revelation has some kind of historical relationship, unless they believe it's completely just symbolic or something, would say, yes, this involves Christ's birth. But notice the next part of the same sentence. Who will rule over all nations with an iron rod? And when does that happen? In the future. After the second coming, isn't it? So here's one sentence, and this isn't the first place this has happened. This happened even in the Old Testament. Micah 5, verse 2, same thing. The first part of the sentence connected to his first coming. Second part of the sentence connected to his second coming. But the child was snatched away and taken to God and his throne. And of course, that would be the miraculous resurrection of Christ and his return to heaven. The woman fled to the desert to a place God had prepared for her where she would be taken care of for 1260 years days. The woman fled to the desert. What do you think that's talking about? Well, if the woman is fleeing, mm -hmm. something bad is happening to her that she's running away. Mm -hmm. And there was a time in earth history when the church was undergoing some severe persecutions mm -hmm. during the, we call them the dark ages. Mm -hmm. It might be that this is what it's talking about. Okay and she flees to a wilderness. That would be run away from, 
Now, in the book of Revelation, particularly in chapter 17, it just specifically says waters refer to places where there's a lot of people. So if she's fleeing to the desert, would that suggest she's, she's running away from populations of people, right? Yes. Then we come to, the, uh, well, we, going on here, then war broke out in heaven. Wow. War broke out in heaven. Joanne, here you go. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon who fought back with his angels. But the dragon was defeated and he and his angels were not allowed to stay in heaven any longer. So here's where it talks about the devil and his angels being thrown out. The huge dragon was thrown out, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, that deceived the whole world. He was thrown down to earth and all his angels with him. Now there is something you can uh, discuss at your length privately with your friends if you like. What was Satan thrown down to if this was before the creation of this earth? We've heard somewhere in here uh, the abyss. Okay. Which yeah. sounds like where he's going later yes. also to yes. abyss meaning uh, a void. Well, abyss is the word they use in Genesis 1-1 to talk about the without earth was form. without form and void. That would be an abyss in Greek. There's uh, another place in Revelation where it talks about abyss, and we talk about that as a time when there's nobody on earth to talk to, all the wicked are dead, the righteous are gone, and his lack of ability to communicate with any, anybody or do any damage is called an abyss. It's an empty, waste place. So it would be some place where uh, he couldn't do any damage. Now, I don't know whether that's a rock pile or a place in space that's void, but at least nobody's talking to him. Okay. Could, could Satan have been thrown down to this world before the world was created, and then it, Satan was on he, the earth when God was creating all around him? Well, one of the, this is an intriguing idea. Think about it. This is, this is a one way of understanding this. There are some suggestions that Satan wanted to be part of the creation committee, if you will, in heaven. He wanted to be a creator, and he wanted to work with God, and when God sort of wouldn't, said, no, you, you, you're not capable of doing that, he said, well, why not? And God says, you're not a creator, and he says, oh, I, I could be, just give me a chance. And there are those who say, and I think this is an intriguing thought, that God had already made the rock ball here that we would call planet Earth, it was sitting here, but hasn't, nothing has been done with it yet. God might have said to Satan, okay, here's a rock ball. See what you can do with it. You're a creator. See what you can do with it. And of course, nothing happened. And then God says, okay. And then God says, watch what happens when I create. And we have creation week. And probably uh, God, I don't know, like uh, Satan can't... Uh, have children. Yeah. And so here everybody on earth is able to create, create sons and daughters, the animals even can the even animals. create, and Satan is standing there and he can't create a thing. Yeah. Well, then I heard a loud voice, verse 10, saying, Now God's salvation has come, now God has shown his power as king, now his Messiah has shown his authority, for the one who stood before our, our God and accused our brothers and sisters day and night has been thrown out of heaven. And notice back up there, it clearly says in verse 9, he was thrown down to earth. So Norm, it wasn't just an empty spot in space. He was thrown down to earth. Okay. It says right there. See, it's a little bit confusing if this is in chronological order. Why? Because he's thrown down after he's already uh, been uh, uh, after the child. Yeah, well, I see what you're saying, yeah. It, it, this is a flashback. Yeah, it's I looking mean, back to the... Revelation is not a chronological book. No. There, well, and we've seen that again. We, with, the, with the seven churches, we went through pretty much all of Christian history. We come over to the seven seals, we go through Christian history again. We come over to trumpets, we go through Christian history again, covering different aspects of that history, but it, we keep going back and going over the same time periods. So... Now we have, um, our brothers and sisters won the victory over him, that says over the dragon, by the blood of the Lamb and by the truth which they proclaimed, and they were willing to give up their lives and die. 
And so be glad, you heavens, and all you that live there. Norma, here's where you started reading. But how terrible for the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you and he's filled with rage because he knows that he has only a little time left. And if someone believes fervently that there's only a short time until Christ comes again, what do we call those people? Adventist. <laughs> Adventist. So the devil is an Adventist with a small a, not a big a. Not a Seventh-day Adventist, he's an Adventist. Okay. I have a question about, if I might, yeah. about verse 9. Mm -hmm. The great dragon was thrown down, to that ancient serpent was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. Mm -hmm. I wonder, uh, what does uh, Greek tell us there? Is, is it just the world that he's deceiving? Wasn't he deceiving in heaven? We yes. maintain that he was decept deceptive in heaven. And uh, I always wondered about that, why they didn't, uh, but maybe the uh, Bible writers or the, or the translators didn't uh, incorporate that concept. Um, give me just a second and I will. If you said the deceiver of all, then it would be a little yes. bit more encompassing, yeah. but I don't know what the concern about the Greek Well, to say. have a third of the angels turn against God and follow Satan required some deception, I would, I would say. That's the operation. That's the way it works, seems to me. Okay. But he has deceived everyone on this right. world. So, is, I'm, I'm just it, wondering, well, it, but it, it was says, deception began before this earth. Right. This earth was to answer those questions about the deception. It doesn't actually say come down to this world. It says come down to, the Greek says, has come down to you. Whoa. But how does it, de he's the deceiver of what? Um, what does the Greek say there? Yeah, hold on here, just a second. Come down, I'm getting back. He's only, he, well, uh, just coming before he's down, come down to you. Yeah. Coming down to you is far more personal than coming yeah, down to the earth. It's only a short time. The deceiver has come down to you? Yes, that's all it says. Well, there we go. So that's the next So the, dis the most of the Bibles have been misleading us. Mm -hmm. So that, that's my take on it. I don't know if, if the deceiver in heaven has come, come down, down to you. Right, and, but the, the, you can't get that out of this reading unless Hold you on. have a, a mindset. On. Let me make. Oh, no! It, it, it's um, I, I'm sorry. I was on verse twelve instead of verse nine. nine. It's come down to. Um, this is a very interesting word in um, in Greek. It refers to an empire. Is not the word. It's not the word for world that we would normally use. Okay. This is oikumene, from which we get ecumenical. Deceiver of all, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I, I like I like that much better than, than what we've been uh, saddled with. Yeah. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, and I'm we're, I'm not going to take time to read the next four sections, but we'll just go through them quickly. The third scene: the dragon opposes the woman. And we're going to talk about what happens there. The fourth scene, the leopard-bodied sea beast is introduced. The fifth scene, the leopard-bodied beast blasphemes and persecutes. That's Revelation 13, 5 to 10. The sixth scene, the lamb-horned beast aids the leopard beast. Revelation 13, 11 to 18. Then there's the assurance, the 144,000 will sing on Mount Zion. Revelation 4, 1 to 5, 14, 1 to 5. There's the assignment, the task that needs to be done. The three angels' message must proclaim. The three angels must proclaim their messages, Revelation 14, 6 through 13, and then the seventh scene, harvesting the grain and the grapes, symbolizing God's judgment, verses 14 through 20 of chapter 14. So here we see we have seen we have scenes from the very beginning of history of sin and the conflict in heaven right down to the final events of this earth's history, representing God's judgment. A question. Yes. Uh, only one third of the angels left. Does that mean that the other ones that stayed, they had questions as well? They questioned God? Well, yes. However, you can't document that very easily from Scripture. Uh, those of us who believe in the writings of Ellen White, who was the founder of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, she says absolutely that that's true. Yes. But their questions have been either resolved or they've just accept it. At this point in history. I've yeah. heard it said that uh, all of them heard the lies. Mm -hmm. The two-thirds that hung around it in heaven 
chose to stick around to see what the evidence would bring forth, and the full ultimate uh, evidence was at the cross. Uh, they, yes, God is righteous. As he, as he. What, what do we know about why the war started in heaven? It seems that, um, you know, just put simply, perhaps God had a plan and, and others, the devil, may have had something else in mind, a different path. Mm -hmm. rather than every word that God said, and uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, if I might just jump off for a second in chapter 12, verse 17, halfway through, where the devil went off to make war against the remnant of her offspring. And who are her offspring? Those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's one path and then there's another path. Mm -hmm. Which path will we be on? Yes. Hopefully we're on the path that's going to follow Jesus, obey the commandments, and hold to the testimony of Jesus. There are two passages in the Old Testament that give us a clue about why the war started in heaven. One is found in, Reve in Isaiah 14. Uh, I'm going to look at verses 12 through 15. King of Babylonia. Now, I'm not going to go to all the details about why it refers to him as the king of Babylonia, but then it says, bright morning star. Can you guess what bright morning star yes. would be in Latin? Lucifer. 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 You have fallen from heaven. In the past you conquered nations, but now you've been thrown to the ground. You were determined to climb up to heaven and to place your throne above the highest stars. You thought you would sit like a king on that mountain in the north where the gods assemble. You said you would climb to the tops of clouds and be like the Almighty. But instead, you've been brought down to the deepest part of the world of the dead. So Satan wanted to be like a god. Okay? Look. It, mm -hmm. This was just an old fashioned or <clears throat> maybe the first power struggle. Satan wanted uh, God off his throne and wanted to sit on it himself. Yes. At least sit alongside God with equal power. Now, isn't there one particular scripture somewhere else where perhaps it, it references Jesus as the bright morning star? Jesus in several places in the Bible is called the day star or the bright morning star. So this name that was given to Lucifer was one of the names of Jesus. Yeah. Well, look at Ezekiel 28. That's the other passage. Ezekiel 28. I'm going to read from verse 11 through um, 15. The Lord spoke to me again, mortal man, he said, grieve for the fate that is waiting for the king of Tyre. Now we had the king of Babylonia, now we have the king of Tyre. Tell him what I, the sovereign Lord, am saying. You were once an example of perfection. Do you think that could be talking about a human being? No. no. How wise and handsome you were. You lived in Eden. Well, who, is, who lived in Eden? The garden of God and wore gems of every kind, rubies and diamonds, topaz, beryl, carnelian, jasper, sapphires, emeralds, and garnets. You had ornaments of gold. They were made for you on the day you were created. I put a terrifying angel there to guard you. You lived on my holy mountain and walked among the sparkling gems. Your conduct was perfect from the day you were created until you began to do evil. And who would that be talking about, I wonder? Lucifer, when he started changing into Satan. And for Seventh-day Adventists, there is a much more detailed report in the first few chapters of the book, Patriarchs and Prophets. Lucifer, one of the holy beings standing around the throne of God in heaven, became jealous and envious of Michael, the archangel, a code name for Jesus Christ himself. As we will see, this ultimately resulted in a war right in heaven itself. And what was the result of that war? We're going to have to wait and find that out because it has very important implications for all of us. And we're going to talk about that when we come back. So don't go away.
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stay by. We were going to look and, and, and get some idea about what are the implications of this angel who wanted to be like God. He was thrown down to earth, as we read in Revelation 12, uh, verse 7 to 12, and with his angels. So they're thrown down to this earth, and then God came and began to create the beautiful Garden of Eden, and Satan was right there demanding a part of it, and of course his place was given him in that one tree in the garden, and Adam and Eve went there. So we have to recognize that the war that started in heaven has spread very quickly to this earth. Um, in the hardly a creation that happened here until the, it, w it was spread here. When well, God, yes? What kind of war was it? Are we ready well, for that? Okay. Are we still coming to that? Yes, that's a good question. Um, clearly it wasn't a, a war with guns and cannons and airplanes and so forth like this. I mean, how could those things pro possibly do anything to an angel that you can't even, at least we can't even see? Uh, and he can fly faster than any bullet anyway, so why would that be a problem? So people have discussed that. Um, some have suggested it was a war of ideas. Some have suggested that uh, when this war started, God the Father, the main source of the glory, and Christ had veiled his glory to walk among the angels as an angel. That's why he was called Michael the Archangel. And the Father stepped back and veiled his glory. Stayed. It doesn't, say, it doesn't talk about him being involved in the war. But then after the, 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 the ideas and, and the, whatever war had, was talked, happened, w w took place for a period of time, and it seemed pretty clear that everybody had pretty much decided which side they would be on. Then the Father came out again, and those who were out of harmony said, it's time for us to get out of here. And that word war, where, what word does that come from? In Greek? You're talking, I, I'd have to look and see here. Hold on. I'm wondering if that defined it. 12-7 and 12-7. Yeah, hold on here just a second. Let's go to where we can get to that very quickly. Just to learn what went on in heaven. Does Jesus visit um, other planets and stuff and to be nearer the beings he, he uh, can be one of them? Yeah, yeah. War is a polemic. Polemic. Polemos. Polemos. What does that mean? Greek. Well, we use the word polemic in our day to refer to a, a real intense argument of words and so forth. Would it be like politics, polemos? Politics? Well, yeah, it's, it's related, but this is a conflict. So uh, it could be a conflict of ideas, words, uh, argument. Mm -hmm. Truth versus untruth. Truth versus error. untruth. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the war in heaven was truth versus untruth. Mm -hmm. What do you think were the chances that, that the argument had gone on in heaven and had really come to, to an impasse? Mm -hmm. Those who were going to be faithful to God were a group that had made up their mind. Mm -hmm. Those who were a group that were not going to be there, there wasn't anybody changing sides. And so God can say, mm -hmm. the decisions are made. Let's get the ones that don't want to be with me out of here and, yeah. let, and protect the rest of them. Yeah. No, I, I think so. I think, I think, and that's the way God's judgment is going to happen at the end as well. That's right. It, so it, it kind of fits that model. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we know about what happened in the Garden of Eden. There was a tree of life and not far from it the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and um, you know what happened there. I don't know that we need to, to read that. Well, perhaps we should. There's a couple things we should look at before we, before we leave that. Uh, one would be Revelation, I'm sorry, Genesis 2, verses 17, where it talks about the tree. Uh, I wish you'd start with 15. Then the Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and guard it. He said to him, you may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden except the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad. You must not eat the fruit of that tree. If you do, you will die the same day. And what was Satan's response to that? 
You will not certainly die. Genesis, yeah, you will not certainly die. Genesis 3, 1. Now the snake was the most cunning animal that the Lord had made. The snake asked the woman, did God really tell you not to eat fruit from any tree in the garden? We may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden, the woman answered, except the tree in the middle of it. God told us not to eat the fruit of that tree or even touch it. If we do, we will die. The snake replied, that's not true. You will not die. God said that because he knows that when you eat it, you will be like God and know what is good and what is bad. Now, they already knew what was good. So what are they going to learn by eating from the tree? They're going to learn what's bad, right? <clears throat> so Satan brought his arguments and his untruths from heaven down to earth mm -hmm. and tried them out on Eve. Mm -hmm. And she fell for it. And isn't that just like a human? God gives you everything in the world. Mm -hmm. And she wanted the one thing that God says don't do it. Mm -hmm. Well, Satan, of course, claimed that God was withholding something from Adam and Eve that ought to be, you know, might have sounded like it was really, really desirable. And, of course, when God came down to meet them in the cool of the evening, what happened? They ran from God. They ran. They, were, they ran away because they said, we're naked. How did they decide that? Well, that's a good question. There's no key text that explain why they decided that. But he promised them that sin would eventually be dealt with, and that would be a revelation. I'm sorry, Genesis. Sorry, I'm stuck on Revelation. Genesis 3.15. It's very interesting if you look at that verse in the original languages. I will make you and the woman hate each other. Her offspring and yours will always be enemies. Her, her, and that, that part in there is, is in plural. Her offspring will crush your head. Her offspring, singular, will crush your head and you will bite her offspring's heel, singular again. So the, the people who will be affected are all of us, but one person is going to crush the Satan's head and who would that be? Christ. Mm -hmm. Jesus. I will see to it that the woman hates Satan and that her children will resist Satan's children. One of her sons will hit Satan fatally on the head, but Satan will badly bruise him. That's a sort of a paraphrase. Free, free translation. Free translation. <laughs> and we know what happened with Cain. Almost immediately we find that sin had terrible consequences while attempting to worship God. Cain, the firstborn son of Adam and Eve, became angry with his brother Abel because his sacrifice was not accepted as Abel's was. And that's the story of Genesis 4, 1 to 16. Instead of correcting his own problem, which should have been the obvious solution, right? He became angry because his brother's sacrifice was accepted, and so he killed Abel. Mm -hmm. Notice that Cain didn't stop worshiping God. He just wanted to worship God in his own way. He didn't want to learn more about God. He wanted to manipulate God. And here was from the Interpreter's Bible, an interesting interpretation of that. It was a strange contradiction that the first murder came with an act of worship. It was while he was approaching God that Cain knew how much he hated his brother. He felt frustrated because he felt somehow that God's truth ranked Abel higher than himself. And if he knew within himself that this was what he deserved, he struck out all the more blindly and bitterly against a superiority that had shamed him. If I may? Yeah. But God always loved Cain, even after what he did. Just like he, uh, with his parents before him, Adam and Eve, God provided protection for him even after everything he did. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah. Exactly. Well, you know, even today, when we see someone who's better than us, mm -hmm. uh, do we try to learn from that person? Or we, do we want to ban that person from our life and, and yeah. have them go away? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well. God asked Cain a question. What was the question? Where is your brother? Where is your, Where brother? Is your brother? Exactly. That raises questions in our mind. Um, how do we treat our fellow human beings? And Jesus talks a great deal about that. To come back, however, to the story here in Genesis now, we have a little bit of background. Scene one, the woman, her child, and the dragon are introduced. We should think immediately of Eve, her promised seed, singular, and the lying serpent. So what do each of these be beings symbolize? Right down through history, God's chosen people, who in modern times are referred to as his church, have been represented by a pure and virtuous woman. So in our symbolism now 
especially as we look forward to the, the rest of the book of Revelation, we're going to be talking about women, good and bad. And women, we're going to say, refer to what? The church. Churches. Significant churches. There's going to be a good woman, represents a pure church, and an evil woman, it'll represent what? A, bad a false church. A false, a bad church. So right down through history, it's been like that. At times when God's people are not behaving, they were represented as a sinful woman. And uh, some of the things that God says about his people when they're not misbehaving, well, I mean, when, when they are misbehaving, when they're not behaving, is um, almost too risque to read. Uh, try looking at Ezekiel 16 and 23, for example. We won't go there right now. Um, so frequently in Scripture we are reminded that God is surrounded with a garment of light. Psalms talks about that quite a bit. Jesus is the son of righteousness, Malachi 4.2. God's people are the sons of light, Luke 16.8 and 1 Thessalonians 5, 5 to 8. To people living in this planet, on this planet, the sun, the moon, and the stars represent major symbols of light. Truth and light are God's symbols. Uh, Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. Okay. But sometimes that light gets so bright it's described as fire, is it not? Mm -hmm. Yes. The seed born to the woman represented here in Revelation by the male child can only possibly refer to Jesus Christ himself. Isaiah and Micah prophesied his coming, and you know those verses. Uh, Isaiah 7.14 and Micah 5.2, for example. While Jesus was born to Mary as an individual, symbolically he was given birth to, by and to the people of God. He grew up among the Jews. His birth had been eagerly awaited for centuries. The great red dragon is a fitting symbol for Satan, the former Lucifer. While we know, and of course, how did he first appear to human beings? As a snake. As a snake, which is pretty close to a dragon, right? Mm. While we know that Satan is being originally is a being originally from the courts of heaven and not appearing physically and visibly on this earth, he and his representatives are very active here. So what happened in light of this story? King Herod tried to kill the baby Jesus, Matthew 2, 1 to 12. The Jewish Sanhedrin begged Pontius Pilate to kill Jesus, John 18, 28 to 38. Rome officially crucified him. All these individuals were acting under the direction of Satan himself. But they couldn't keep Jesus in the grave. He How? arose triumphantly and returned to God in heaven and sat down at his right side. How does Satan cause people to want to kill Christ, to kill the baby, to kill the baby well, Jesus? Um, he, he, he looked like a threat to them. Their political system, he was a threat to their political system. Okay. Yeah. So if the, the king sees someone else being born who is potentially a king, if you want your, your children to, get, to be the future kings, you get rid of them. I, th I think Joanne was asking, how does Satan influence people to, to act that way? And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm saying he does that by portraying and the, getting them to think in their minds that this person is a threat to them. Yeah. He, he instills the same pride, the same characteristics that Satan has it burning inside him mm -hmm. into people so they develop the pride that leads to um, wrong actions. Yeah. yeah. So in these first few verses of Revelation 12, we see an ideal true church represented by a, represented by a pure woman, her male child that we say was Jesus, and Satan himself acting on this earth through, in the early stages, the pagan Roman Empire represented by this great red dragon. Any questions about that first scene? <coughs> We're having a little trouble getting through this in a hurry, aren't we? <laughs> scene two, the dragon wars with Michael. We've talked about this many times. Revelation 12, 7 to 12 is very clear. We do not know how war was actually fought in heaven. We don't believe that anyone was actually killed. Our TV camera, if you will, the, John has shown this in vision, so for him it was, it was like pictured, has turned back to the earliest events that we know of. When, however, the war was over, Satan and his followers were cast out of heaven and thrown down to this earth. There was a great shout of victory in heaven. This greatest shout is found in the very center of the book of Revelation. So we've talked about the big B in the very center 
of that V is what? The shout in heaven which resulted when Satan was thrown out. That ought to be a clue about what things we'll be looking for, right? Speak a little bit because I'm confused about it myself. Uh, uh, when we talk about the 10 horns divided into 10 provinces, a lot of people connect that with Augustus Caesar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Explain a little bit. Well, the people who connect that with Augustus Caesar mm -hmm. are people who say not even God has the ability to predict the future. Mm -hmm. So therefore, somehow or other, we have to figure out how to chop things up so that this applies to things that were happening in those days. But if you believe that God has the ability to predict the future, that's not a problem. Okay. You, 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 historically, it fits much better, you know, fitting, fitting these things with various times in the history of, of, the, of God's relationship with the, with the church down through the generations. What's interesting is it seems like when you don't follow the rules that God has set down mm -hmm. for your own health, your own being, and <clears throat> you turn like Satan turned and the angels turn, mm -hmm. they seem to grow a, a certain something in them that doesn't allow them to really, um, I mean, we're all responsible for um, growing our insides, these characteristics that make us either want to follow good or to want to follow bad. Mm -hmm. And if we start letting little weeds grow in ourselves <clears throat> before we know it, we're following Satan full yeah. bore, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> just like uh, Cain. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you see that again and again. <coughs> now, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to make a suggestion to you, those of you who listen to this, this class regularly, just make a note in the back of your mind. We're gonna, I'm going to read to you now Revelation 12, verses 13 to 17, actually up to 18. This is the verse that Norm read earlier, but this is such a key part. And then I'm going to tell you why it's important for you to remember this. When the dragon realized he'd been thrown down to earth, he began to pursue the woman who had, been gi who had given birth to the boy. She was given the two wings of a large eagle in order to fly to her place in the desert, where she will take, be taken care of for three and a half years, safe from the dragon's attack. And then from his mouth the dragon poured out a flood of water after the woman so that it would carry her away. But the earth helped the woman and opened its mouth and swallowed the water that had come from the dragon's mouth. And the dragon was furious with the woman and went off to fight against the rest of her descendants, all those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to the truth revealed by Jesus. And the dragon stood on the seashore. Now, verse 13, would someone like to tell me what time period that's talking about? The woman gives birth to a boy. What have we suggested? Okay. Birth of Jesus. That's the birth of Jesus. We come down to verse 17. The dragon was furious with the woman and went off to fight against the last of her descendants, the rest of her descendants, all those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to the truths revealed by Jesus. It's talking about what time period? Future. This would be the very end of our earth's history, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. So here we have, in mini capsule form, the history of the Christian church from the birth of Christ to the second coming, or at least right up to the second coming. Not, I mean, not doesn't include the actual coming, but right up to the, and we're going to see this same time period expanded. It's going to be expanded in chapter 13, and it's going to be expanded more in chapter 17 to 19. So keep this little bit of church history in mind. Okay. But the flood wasn't a literal flood like water. Because, no. Okay, they're talking about this uh, er a flood of error and heresy. Well, there's two ways to look at that. One way is that's represented by Revelation 17, 15. The angel also said to me, the waters you saw in which the apostles are sitting are nations, peoples, races, and languages. So some interpreters say this is a general guideline for understanding pretty much everything in the book of Revelation that water refers to peoples and so forth like this. And that would mean that if the, if the earth opens up its mouth and swallows the water, it means that the God's true church has escaped far enough away from population that the, the, dragon, the, the bunch of people that are sent out by the, by the beast to 
catch them or to damage them can't get to them. There's another possibility um, that maybe we should mention. You suggested that maybe this waters that would flow out of his mouth or his false teachings and all that kind of stuff. And what would be, how would we respond, how might the earth respond to false teachings of Satan? A lot of people accept it and... Yeah, mm -hmm. okay, but one way it could respond is that the earth has given us archaeology, mm. it's giving us geology, and as more and more of that is being discovered, especially archaeology, the false claims that Satan has made in the past through his representatives here on this earth are one by one being overturned and being shown, no, that's not true. And there's many, 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 many examples that we could give of, of things that have firm, been firmly believed by people in the past, but archaeology and... and uh, people so didn't we, believe the Bible and different stories in the Bible existed, and then archaeology says, oh no, we found, a, uh, we did a dig and we found uh, information, and yeah. look at that, the Bible's right. Yeah. But common to almost all of those interpretations is the fact that the devil and his agents here on this earth mm -hmm. are, are going after and trying to persecute the church. Mm -hmm. But it is protected. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, that's kind of the bottom yeah. line of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Well, and there's other times. Look at the story of the flood. God's people are protected, a small group of them in the boat. Look at the story of Revelation. I'm, I'm sorry, the Exodus and the, God's people are taken out of Egypt on eagle's wings, it says. Same kind of idea, being carried away from mm -hmm. the corruption that were, they were there in down there in Egypt. Well, sometimes... And the flood of water swept away Pharaoh and his men. Sorry to interrupt. Mm -hmm. and, and the people in the flood. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And God uses uh, items of the earth to protect his people. Mm -hmm. He split the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. uh, the Red Sea came on uh, the church's enemies and uh, he used the flood, so he uses items of the earth. Yeah, well, failing to destroy God's true church, failing to destroy, to, to catch and destroy Jesus while he was here on this earth, Satan is now furious and he's determined to destroy what's left of God's representatives here on this earth and what, what represents God's God here on this earth in our day? His church. His church. So Satan is determined to destroy God's church. So we're you're, you're saying that Satan is on all-out war against the members that yep. step into God's church? Yes. Well, what are the identifying marks of this final group of people? They obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. They obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. But I thought I heard a lot of uh, Christian folks around the world say that we don't have to keep the commandments anymore. That doesn't seem Which to be kind of silly. Uh, it, we can murder and do all that. Yeah. I guess they're implying. Well, they make a couple exceptions there. Oh, okay. If it, if so murder is kind of close to home. The idea is what you can. You, we'll pick and choose what we like, huh? Yeah. Eclectics. It doesn't well, say that we can obey eight of God's commandments. It says God's commandments. Okay. Sure. Revelation 19:10 gives us a little bit of a clue what we're talking about here. Revelation 19.10, I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, don't do it. This is an angel from heaven. I am a servant together with you and with your fellow believers, all those who hold to the truth that Jesus revealed, worship God for the truth that Jesus revealed, that's the testimony of Jesus, is what inspires the prophets, or in the more traditional translations, is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony, what's the testimony of Jesus? Jesus says he came to show us the Father. Does that have something to do okay. with it? Here's some words. Now, Seventh-day Adventists have tended to believe that the God's true people at the end of time would have among them a prophet, someone who could correctly uh, guide the church to the final days of this earth's history. This is what that prophet said about the testimony of Jesus. I'm reading from... Um, this is a, a, a short, a couple of paragraphs taken from Signs of the Times, one of our church papers, written in January 20, 1890. The law of Jehovah was burdened with needless exactions and traditions. God was represented as severe, exacting, revengeful, and arbitrary. 
He was pictured as one who could take pleasure in the sufferings of his creatures. The very This is in the days of Jesus. The very attributes that belong to the character of Satan, the evil one represented as belonging to the character of God. So what's happening here? Satan has misrepresented God in every possible way by claiming that the truth, the real characteristic, his real characteristics are God's characteristics. Jesus came. Now this would be the testimony of Jesus. Jesus came to teach men of the Father to correctly represent him before the fallen children of earth. Angels could not fully portray the character of God, but Christ, who is a living impersonation of God, could not fail to accomplish the work. The only way, the only way in which he could set and keep men right was to make himself visible and familiar to their eyes. If Jesus correctly represents the Father, then by making himself visible, he does what? Makes the Father visible. He makes the Father visible. Christ exalted the character of God, attributing to him the praise and giving to him the credit of the whole purpose of his mission on earth to set men right through the revelation of God. In Christ was arrayed before men the paternal grace and the matchless perfections of the Father. In his prayer, just before his crucifixion, he declared, I have manifested thy name, praying to his Father. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. What was that? When the object of his mission was attained, the revelation of God to the world, the Son of God announced that his work was accomplished and that the character of the Father was made manifest to men and, of course, women. That says a great deal to us about what was going on here. Very important. And it tells us, by the way, if Jesus' most important job was to reveal the truth about God, what is supposed to be the work of the remnant of his seed? The same. Shouldn't we be doing the same thing? Shouldn't we be correctly representing God? Matthew, Jesus himself said in Matthew 5, 16, let everyone see your good works so that they may glorify your Father which is in heaven. Jesus represented his Father mm -hmm. by an unselfish life where he devoted himself to others. Mm -hmm. Is that what we're supposed to That's do? That's exactly what we're supposed to be doing. We'll talk about it some more later. See you.